Um, my name is Mark Lanier. On behalf of my sweet wife, Becky, and the entire uh, Lanier Foundation, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank the people who are watching this in the overflow. I want to thank the people who are watching this on the internet. You are in for a fantastic evening. First, a couple of announcements. Announcement number one. After this is over, there will be a reception. If there is a chance for Alistair to sign a few books, he will, but I'm warning you now. It is four in the morning where he comes from or something like that. He didn't fly over here to get adjusted for a week. He got here, we put him to work nonstop, and he leaves tomorrow right after church. So he will sleep need to sleep at some point. So he will be there, but he will be there briefly. That means if you're getting something signed or you're whatever, please do it with speed because the people behind you won't get a chance to see him. Otherwise, we will whisk him away. So be thoughtful in that regard. Announcement number two. Uh, as you are making your way outside, the street itself is very uneven. Please be careful about that and walk with care, especially if you're a woman in heels. Uh, um, but anybody, just be careful. It's easy to trip. If you need help, we have people who can help and uh, we'll try to do so. Uh, announcement next. We've got some fantastic lectures coming up. I hope you're tuned in for them. We've got George Yancey coming April 20th. We've got a, our annual Spanish night. For those who don't know, one night a year or one weekend a year, we do the entire uh, um, weekend in Spanish. And so all the announcements are in Spanish, the welcome's in Spanish, the speaker's in Spanish. So if you want to come to that, uh, we've got Pablo Dairas. You said just say it fast and people would be confident, but I messed it up. Pablo de Iros, uh coming in uh, April 27th. We're excited about that. I hope you'll be here. Muy bien. <laughs> June 8th, uh, uh, one of our favorites, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, will be here. Uh, we're excited about that. September 21, we start the fall with Amy Orr Ewing. Uh, guaranteed to be fantastic. We've got Esau McCauley and others on the schedule. So thank you for being here. We love to have you back. There will be a reception afterwards with food. Uh, please uh, make your way. Last announcement, and then we'll pray, and then I'll introduce our speaker tonight. When you get someone of, of certain um, productivity in life, someone with uh, something to say, People are eager to hear, and I can think of no higher accolade for someone than others in the field, if you will, to clamor for a chance to listen. And so we've got some outstanding scholars who are here tonight, and we recognize them and thank them for being here, recognizing that, that we would all love to be here to hear them speak as well. And so if you've not heard Colin, if you've not heard Keith, if you've not heard Kevin, if you've not heard, um, um, I see Michael Lloyd out there, the principal at Wycliffe Hall, who has a wicked sense of humor and sometimes something to say. Uh, we've got, uh, um, <laughs> I can only say that because he doesn't get the mic back. We've got our own David Capes. We've got countless scholars in here that are wonderful to visit with. So when you go to the reception, you'll want to just take pictures with lots of people and then go home and run them through Google Images to see who you stood next to. <laughs> Speaking of scholars, we have the president of Dallas Baptist University right here, Adam. Adam A. Wright. A stands for always. Adam's always, always right. I, you know, it's, it's not, A is not even his middle initial. Um, but we want to welcome everybody here. Pastor David Fleming, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Let's join together. Father, we are so grateful for this night and for the privilege to gather together. Thank you for Mark and Becky and the family and the foundation for the provision of tonight and for the uh, great resources that we have at our disposal and for these who have come from near and far, we're so grateful that you are here. We welcome you here, Holy Spirit, and pray that you would speak into our hearts and into our minds, into our lives. And as we always pray, this will be far more than an academic endeavor or exercise, but this might truly be life-changing 
We pray that you'd make us more like Jesus by what we've heard and experienced tonight. Bless our speaker. We thank you for Professor McGrath and your safe deliverance of him to us as well as all of these others from all over the place. We pray the same as they return home and especially even now that you will speak to us and through us and make a difference in our world for the sake of Christ and for his gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. So you have below your seats note cards. These note cards are for you to write questions. If you're in the overflow rooms, they'll be collected and ushered here as quickly as possible. We will have at the conclusion of Alistair's lecture tonight a Q&A time. Now, Alistair, and I'll speak from what I believe to be true, he would never use these superlatives. And if I'm offending someone, sue me. Um, <laughs> Alistair is in some ways I believe to be the world's leading expert on the thought and life of C.S. Lewis. He has intensely studied that for years and years and years, first in his formative years as a young Christian uh, or an older Christian when he became a Christian, but but in his Christian walk, he's also uh, done this uh, uh, in an intense way over the last five years to decade plus. And so as you write your questions and answers, or no, you don't write the answers, he gives them. As you write your questions, I'll give you a chance if you'd like to address it. I'll just assume it's addressed to Alistair, but if you want to address it to C.S. Lewis, I will ask Alistair to give his best answer that he believes Lewis would give you in answer to that question. And while, of course, it would not be precise, I dare say it's better than anyone else would speculate on that matter. And so uh, I give you that. Now, here's the official introduction. And I can think of no better way to introduce you than a story. When we started having library events, I started working hard to get some people who had really affected my life to come lecture. Some of those I knew. And it was fine for me to get Father Justin from St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai to come give a lecture. He was a friend. It was fine for me to get a number of different friends. But I wanted Alistair McGrath. And I had never met Alistair McGrath. Somehow, I weaseled his email address. And I sent him an email. I put my best lawyerly persuasion into this email. I painted the vision of what we're trying to do here. I tried to entice him with Texas hospitality and goodies, whatever we had that we could offer him. And I sent the email out with a prayer. And I want to tell you, he answered me. He answered me promptly, and he said no. <laughs> he, he, was, he was very gracious. I, I felt so good the way he said no. <laughs> I mean, he just has so many opportunities, and as a good steward of every breath he takes and every note he speaks, he needed to steward those carefully. He didn't have time. But he did say, if you're ever in Oxford, be sure to look me up. I'd love to have a cup of tea. Well, little did he know, our son spent 12 years in Oxford and was rowing in the summer eights that summer, which is an Oxford boat race where you have eight people, uh, along with the person yelling the commands, uh, rowing in this competition. So I saddled up. I went over to England, Oxford, and I set up a time, and he had this sliver of a time that I could fit into. I said, I will be there. I will be at your office. He gave me his office address. The problem is our son had made it to the finals, the, the final day of rowing, and he was one match from winning his oars, which is a huge thing over there. And the race was starting just about the time I was supposed to meet Alistair. And I couldn't figure out what to do. I, I didn't want to disappoint my son who's standing there looking up to see if I'm there watching. 
while I'm thinking, can I scoot away and run, keep my appointment? Um, I watched Will compete. I ran as fast as I could, and I got there 10 minutes late for a 15-minute time slot. Alistair was gracious. He had never met me before. He was gracious, he was kind, he understood. And that spoke volumes to me that this man who understood theology better than I ever will, this man who understood church history better than I ever will, this man who understands C.S. Lewis better than I ever will, understood the importance of gracious Christian response, reception, and life. And those are an incredible combination that testified to the work of God's Spirit in someone. So I can tell you about all his degrees. I can tell you we've got 88 of his books over there, and we're trying to get the rest of them. I can tell you all of his productivity. But what I can most tell you is this is a Christian gentleman, and it's our honor. By the way, it only took me five minutes to talk him into coming once he realized how important we, we needed him. Uh, that was the real purpose of the tea visit. Five minutes, we were done. He came. This is his fourth visit. We have, we have, yes. Would you join me in welcoming Alistair McGrath? Thank you. Well, Mark, thank you very much. And it's a huge pleasure and privilege to be here again. And to talk uh, about C.S. Lewis, but really, um, Lewis not as a sort of um, lecture dealing with his history, more asking a very pragmatic question, which is what can we do with him? How can Lewis help us think about faith? How can Lewis help us grow in our faith? How can Lewis help the ministry of the church? So I'm hoping that this will be a useful lesson, which is really about trying to open up how significant this man is and why he's so significant. And obviously I can give you the background information, like um, myself, in fact, he was born in Belfast, uh, in his case in November 1898, in my case, slightly more recently. Um, and uh, what's interesting about him was that by the age of 16, he was a convinced atheist. And I think that, that is, again, significant, because um, when I was that age, I was also an atheist. I'd never heard of C.S. Lewis, but actually, Lewis really spoke to me as somebody who'd been where I had been. And Lewis won a scholarship to Oxford University in 1917, but as you can imagine, this was during the First World War, so Lewis in effect was unable to really begin his studies properly. He arrived at Oxford for one term, and that was really it. And during that time, he basically began his studies, but was not really able to do very much. And Lewis went on to serve in the British Army, he was very badly wounded, and came back to England. And of course, his experience of war really intensified his atheism. So we're dealing with someone who was an atheist, a very aggressive atheist, someone who really knew why he was an atheist. And that, I think, makes what happens next all the more interesting. And I think that uh, Lewis's question was, how on earth, if there is a God, could this God allow war to take place? Now, there's a rather nice photograph of Lewis in May 1917. He's on the back row, right-hand side. All I want to do is just look at that young man. Uh, Lewis was about to go off into officer training, and he would then be posted to France. And what I want you to imagine is this. Would that young man in that photograph have said to himself, you know, one day, I'll be one of the world's greatest Christian apologists. Well, the answer is no. Number one, because he was a rather aggressive atheist at this time. Number two, because his thoughts would rather be on whether I'm going to survive this war. And that was really probably the limits of his horizon at this time. I think, again, it's just nice to look at that photograph and see it as a kind of trophy of God's grace. Here is someone, an atheist, who in effect became what you and I would recognize as one of the most significant Christian writers of the 20th century, with ongoing significance, of course, far beyond that, which is why we're meeting here tonight. Let's begin to look at Lewis in a little bit more detail. 
Lewis survived the war. He was wounded, but he returned to Oxford in 1919 after recovered from his injuries, and he then began his studies of classics. Um, he followed this with a degree of, in English language and literature, and I will just tell you that um, Oxford's degree in English language and literature is meant to take three years. Lewis did it in nine months and got first-class honours. So you, we are dealing with somebody who is actually remarkably intelligent, and Lewis, I think, really um, excelled in this second field. Um, although he was a classicist, he specialised in classical philosophy, but really it was English that captured his imagination. And so, of course, he became tutor in English language and literature at Morden College, Oxford, back in 1925, and stayed in that role for nearly 30 years, before moving to Cambridge, where he became professor of medieval and Renaissance English in 1954, and as you all know, I think, he died at Oxford in 1963. Let me show you a nice picture. There is the building in Modern College Oxford in which Lewis had his rooms. I think it's not an exaggeration to say it was probably one of the most beautiful buildings in Oxford, and the view from Lewis's windows is just remarkable. So we're going to begin to look at Lewis. Lewis is very important for many of you, I know that. He's very important for me. Why? Well, because when I came up to Oxford, I was an atheist who was teetering. I was sort of always beginning to think it's not that straightforward, it's not that simple. And I converted to Christianity during my first term at Oxford University. Began to ask my friends all those difficult questions like, um, why do Christians believe in the Trinity? That sort of thing. I think my friends ex exasperated, eventually said, look, um, why don't you start reading C.S. Lewis? And I, I had heard of Lewis. I knew he'd written a book about a lion or something. Uh, but that was, that was about as far as it went, really. Uh, but I went out in February 1974 and bought a book by C.S. Lewis. It was, they asked for a paper, and I read in that collection of essays, the essay entitled, Is Theology Poetry? And I was really just transfixed by its intellectual depth by the way Lewis seemed to anticipate my questions and gave me very good answers. I imagine you all know how that uh, essay ends, where Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not just because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. And really that spoke to me very, very powerfully, and from that moment onwards, really, Lewis was my well, my traveling companion on my road of faith, as he is to this day. So let's begin to think about Lewis's early atheism. Because one of the points I'm going to make is that Lewis was an atheist who knew why he was so, but who became a Christian, and again, knew what it was about Christianity that really captured his imagination and his mind, and therefore, in effect, was being set up almost to be a Christian apologist. What did Lewis um, find in atheism? Well, I think Lewis really remained an atheist until the late 1920s, but it's not really clear he saw it as doing anything very much. He had three very good reasons for being an atheist. Number one, he believed that science had made religious belief simply irrelevant. Number two, he took the view, like Freud there, which you can see, you can see hiding behind the, the typescript, and that religion was a human invention, or if you like, a wish fulfillment. And then thirdly, he took the view that the First World War made it impossible to believe in God on account of the suffering and devastation it caused. And all of this seemed very sensible, but Lewis was beginning to realize that, well, you know, atheism might be, uh, might be right, but it was terribly, terribly dull. It was uninteresting. It was existentially unhelpful. It didn't do anything for him. And so you see Lewis beginning to, beginning to wonder if this really is right. Um, and so Lewis does describe in Surprised by Joy some of the anxieties that he experienced about atheism at that time. Let's look at two of them. Here's one of them. I'm sorry, I seem to have jumped ahead there. Just uh, go back. There we are. First of all was this argument from suffering. And many of you will know this passage in which Lewis begins to open up the almost 
contradictory situation he found himself in, in reflecting on God and the problem of evil. And he writes, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so, so cruel and unjust. But here's the question, how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man doesn't call a line crooked unless he's got some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? And you see there Lewis making the point that, in effect, I needed a transcendent referent to be able to make that judgment. But if I believed in a transcendent referent, well, actually, that is rather pointing the direction of God. So there's a problem here. And Lewis basically thought, maybe I'm just, in effect, mistaking a matter of taste with a robust intellectual argument against God. Or again, let's move on and look at the next one, the limits of rationalism. Again, many of you will recognize this very powerful statement, which Lewis, in effect, said, look, um, if I limited myself to reason, I end up with a very small and dull world, but my imagination, my intuition, was telling me there's a bigger world. And he talks about this contrast within his mind. On the one side, a many-islanded sea of poetry and myth. On the other, a glib and shallow rationalism. Nearly all that I loved I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all that I believed to be real I thought grim and meaningless. So you can see Lewis beginning to change his mind. And obviously we could have a very interesting discussion about exactly what happened. But what I want to do is to look at what happened next. Lewis discovered Christianity. And he began to realize how important this was to him. So we are seeing Lewis basically as a very interesting case study. Someone who had been a very aggressive atheist and knew why, but was now a Christian and also knew why. And so Lewis, I think, looking back, maybe it wasn't that surprising he ended up being an apologist. Someone who could speak to atheism as someone who had been there, who knew the territory, who knew the arguments, and yet was now able to speak from the other side. So Lewis, I think, really was someone who believed he could help others who were atheists to reflect on their position. That's why this book, The Problem of Pain, published in 1940, is so interesting. Many of you will have read it. It actually is a surprisingly good book. But here's the point I want to make. Up to this point, Lewis had decided the books he wanted to write. For example, um, The Pilgrim's Regress or... um, the allegory of love. This book, Lewis was invited to write. Uh, The series editor of a popular series on Christian thinking felt Lewis would be the one who could address this problem and invited him to do so. And as I read Lewis, I see here, if you like, the issue of external validation. Somebody saying to Lewis, this is who you are. This is what you could do. You are qualified to do this. Will you do it? Lewis wrote this book, and it did well. And as many of you will know, this book led directly to Lewis being asked to give those broadcast talks um, for the BBC, which, of course, ended up becoming mere Christianity. So this book was pivotal, both in terms of Lewis's self-understanding of who he was and what he was meant to be doing, but also led into um, his rise to fame on the BBC, and of course that remarkably important book, Mere Christianity. So I think there's a real issue there about Lewis discovering who he really was. And central to Lewis's thinking is not this idea that Christianity is simply a set of beliefs, this and this and this and this, but rather Christianity gives us an integrated view, a big picture of life. In other words, it's not just a set of beliefs laid out individually, but rather a coordinated set of beliefs which gives you this grand picture of life. And I think it's very important. I used to be a Marxist when I was a teenager, And one of the things that really impressed me about Marxism back then was this idea of a grander vision of life which made sense of the world and gave agency to individuals to move things ahead. And Lewis 
gave me an understanding of Christianity, which in effect did something very similar. There's the text I gave you. It's well worth looking at. And just looking at that, can you appreciate the imaginative depth of that statement? Look at the imagery, a sun rising, illuminating a landscape, enabling you to see things, uh, in effect bringing clarity, allowing you to see things otherwise you might not have seen. And Christianity is something that casts light on the world and ourselves. We see them as they really are, and we can figure out where to go from there. And of course, there's a really important idea that Lewis is trying to articulate here, that he gives us, gives us this big picture, which allows us to f- figure out how we fit in. And of course, as many of you will know, um, Lewis was recently memorialized in Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner, and there is the slab, which is in effect um, a memorial to C.S. Lewis, but also uh, enfolding that text I've just given you, which was chosen as the key Lewis quote to bring out his significance for a modern audience. So how does Lewis help us? How does Lewis help us think about our faith? How does Lewis help us think about how we might deepen our faith and engage our secular culture? And in many ways, that's where we were going to go for the rest of this lecture. You will see peeping out behind stories and arguments a face. That is Austin Farrer. Austin Farrer, one of uh, Lewis's closest friends, a, the, a, a witness to his civil wedding to Joy Davidman, and very significant as a New Testament scholar and also a philosopher of religion. And Lewis was quite clear that we need to show Christianity makes sense, but he went further than that. And Austin Farrer, in a very interesting essay written after Lewis's death, reflecting on why Lewis was such a good apologist, began to tease out what he thought Lewis was all about. Arguments are, they're good, they're helpful, but we need more than that. And his argument is this. Though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. But, Farrer is saying that Lewis realized argument isn't enough. Something more than that is needed, and this is what Farrer has in mind. Lewis appeals to the imagination. We cannot, uh, Farrer says, apprehend anything without an act of imaginative creation. And the point he's making is this. Farrer argues that Lewis makes us think we're listening to an argument, but in reality, we're being presented with a vision And it's the vision that carries conviction. In other words, it is a vision of God, a vision of what we could be, a vision of how we fit into things, which cannot be adequately reduced to words, but can nevertheless be expressed in those words. But it's this idea of a vision, something that in effect excites us, that that makes us say, I want to be part of that. It's something that makes us move from being spectators to participants. It's a very important transition. And that, I think, is really important because Lewis is going to articulate a vision of faith which is about not simply looking at Christianity but rather stepping into this world it opens up and makes possible and realizing that there is space for us within it and that it gives us um, significance and meaning and it allows us to flourish. There's some very important points being made there. Let's begin to focus then on the whole idea of stories. Why are stories so important for Lewis? And of course, um, the Chronicles of Narnia are perhaps the best example of Lewis's narrative style. And I want to begin to reflect with you on why this is so important. The point that Lewis is going to make is that narratives, stories, are God's way of speaking to us. That in effect, God is not simply delivering us beliefs we are asked to assent to, 
but rather is telling a story, a story which in effect invites us to step into it and become part of that. And in many ways, that is what Lewis is doing in particularly The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And you all know this, in my my view, it's, it's the best of the Narnia Chronicles, and certainly the first one you should read. But in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the four children begin to hear stories about the origins and destiny of Narnia. And they begin to realize very quickly that these stories contradict. They can't all be right. They have to make a choice. Which story is right? Which storyteller is to be trusted? Uh, And that's a very important point. And Lewis is, in effect, saying to his readers, look, we live in a world in which there are multiple narratives, meta-narratives, which is right, which is to be trusted. So he's trying to bring a sense of reality to our reflections. And of course, the question is, you know, is Narnia really the realm of this white witch, or is she a usurper that, in effect, her pa- power will be broken? And of course, as you all know, um, Aslan begins to make an appearance. Aslan's not here, but when he comes back, everything is going to change. Which is the right narrative? And that is a very important point, because gradually, as you will all know, one narrative does emerge as being supremely plausible. And the key point I want to make is simply this. The children begin to realize that there is this grand story of Narnia, but that there is place in the story for them. This narrative of interlocking stories makes sense of what the children see and experience around them, but it also invites them to step into this story and become part of it. In other words, it's not the question of which story shall we accept, it is rather which story shall we step into and inhabit, which will give us meaning and dignity, and which we try to live out and work out as we progress so it's a very important idea. It's, Lewis is really saying that faith is about allowing our own stories, which are important, unique to each of us, to become part of something greater and becoming significant and meaningful in doing so. Now, I think there's a lot we can learn from this basic idea. And one is that each of us maintains our own distinct personal identity, if you like, our own story. But we also step into this greater story and we begin to realize that it gives us dignity, significance, purpose. In other words, we suddenly find ourselves within a story which is making space for us, in which we find significance and purpose. And that's a very significant feature of the Christian faith. It's not simply saying, I believe this belief and this belief and this belief. It's about actively stepping into and participating in a story which we help to progress each in our own distinctive way. In other words, we each have a role to play in advancing this greater story, and that gives us significance and meaning. This seems to me to be hugely relevant for thinking about how stories might fit into our personal growth and faith. The picture behind the text is maybe not familiar. It's actually uh, Huldrich Zwingli, the reformer of the city of Zurich in the 16th century. I'm going to tell you what he says shortly and see what you make of it. Let's go back to Lewis. Lewis would say we need to think about our own story as being part of something greater. And Zwingli, in effect, develops this approach in the 16th century, that we need to recognize that we are all part of the same family with a history. And in effect, it's about remembering that history. It's about having a sense of belonging within that history and a sense of mattering. And Zwingli's point is that one of the things that Christians do is they remember the family history. They remember the exodus from Egypt. We were there. We remember um, the um, resurrection of Christ. That's part of our story. We remember that. And Zwingli's key point, if you like, is that there is a distinguished family history 
And now that history is in our hands. We remember what has happened, and we are now moving that narrative ahead in the present day, moving that story ahead. And each of us really asks, what role are we playing in this story? What can we do to move this ahead? And obviously, the whole series of ideas here that Lewis touches on uh, at multiple points in the Chronicles of Narnia, like the idea of grace, we're, we're not doing all this on our own, but nevertheless, this absolute insistence, we matter. There is something we are meant to be doing. We can live in hope because this is not a story that's going to spiral out of control. It has a purpose and we can move it towards its end thinking about uh, the last battle. I think there's some very important points being made here to realize how important our own stories are when they are seen as part of this greater whole. And Lewis develops this point further by saying that, in effect, one of the things that happens so easily is that we allow ourselves to be trapped within a worldview. Very often, we are taken prisoner by the spirit of our age, or we inherit certain ways of thinking that we think are automatically right, and fail to realize that there are other options available. And Lewis, in, particularly in his uh, very interesting sermon, The Weight of Glory, talks about the need to tell a better story, and also the need to break free from the power of captivating worldviews that diminish us, that limit us, and instead find a worldview that allows us to become free, to become the people who God wants us to be. And so Lewis says we need to break the spell of materialism. And he writes these words, spells are used for breaking enchantments as well as for inducing them. And you and I have the need of the strongest spell that can be found to wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness that has been laid upon us for nearly a hundred years. And what Lewis is really saying is we need to be aware that many of us and many of those around us have been trapped in a diminished, impoverishing worldview. And we need to, in effect, find a way of saying there are other ways of thinking about this. There are other pictures of ourselves and the world that are there. And the Christian one is one that answers those questions better, that gives us hope, that allows us to flourish. And we need to find ways of breaking people free from these limiting secular worldviews. Now, Lewis is very, very good about this. And one of the ways he does this is by telling stories of liberation, for example, in the Chronicles of Narnia. But I'm going to give you a modern example. There's a book that I edited with a friend recently. It's called Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. And that's quite a suggestive title. Um, And I have to tell you, I wrote a book on critiquing Richard Dawkins a while back, and it made some very good points about evidential deficiencies and rational shortcomings in Dawkins's arguments, but it was a very dull read. It kind of, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't exactly excite its readers. Dennis Alexander, who I work at the Times, and I began to realize we were coming across people who had read Dawkins and found him to be a gateway to faith. And so we, we asked them to tell their stories. And so we found 12 people who were willing to do this. And these stories are narratives of thinking Dawkins is absolutely right. Isn't this wonderful? This is the future. Then begin to think, hold on a minute. This this isn't right. This doesn't make sense. And the narrative continues. It's disillusionment, disappointment. This This is not right. And then realizing that Dawkins is very critical of Christianity but doesn't get it right. So... Why doesn't he want us to think about Christianity? Let us investigate it. So what we have here is 12 narratives, 12 individual stories of people whose disillusion with Dawkins led them to consider or reconsider Christianity and come to faith. It's very interesting, but here's the point. The stories do the heavy lifting. 
Because the stories do indeed look at some arguments, but they're stories of transformation. They're stories that set out how people began to realize Dawkins is wrong. There is a better option available. It's about how the spell was broken in the case of those 12 individuals. And stories, I think, are the best way of expressing this transformation and helping people to understand how it happened and what it feels like to change your mind in this way. So let me now move on to something that's very important for Lewis, and that's the theme of learning from the past. Lewis, as you, you will know, was a scholar of the Renaissance and the Middle Ages and had a very strong sense of the riches that are there in the past, philosophical riches, but of course Christian riches, spiritual riches, which very often we neglect. And Lewis began to develop a program for trying to retrieve things from the past. Uh, Lewis read classic Christian writers like Dante or George Herbert and found them enormously helpful in his own spiritual growth. They helped him to see things in a new way. I'll talk more about this imagery of seeing things in a new way later in this talk. But I want to unpack it a little bit now by looking at a debate that Lewis got involved in in the 1930s with the Cambridge scholar E.W. Tilward, sometimes called the personal heresy. And it all revolves around this question. What does a poet or a writer, I would add a preacher, try to do? What is a poet trying to do? And Lewis's answer is this. They help us to see reality better. And how do they do that? By saying, this is what we have seen. Does this help you? So let's follow this through. For Lewis, poetry works not by directing attention to the poet, but rather to what it is that the poet has seen. And the poet he writes is not a man who asks me to look at him. He's a man who says, look at that and points. In other words, I want you to see what I have seen. And that's a very important theme for Lewis. Um, Lewis says a poet is not a spectacle who says, look at me, but rather a set of spectacles who says, look through me. And Lewis himself has seen something and wants us to see it as well. And in one sense, that, that's a very good description of Lewis's apologetic method. I've seen this. I want you to see it as well. Let me try and help you appreciate its richness, its depth, its plausibility, the difference it makes. And so, in effect, it's not so much about rational argument. It's trying to open your eyes so that you can see this and experience its transformative potential. Well, I think it's very important. And this is Lewis in a late work, one of his best works, I think, An Experiment in Criticism, trying to explain how he thinks other writers can help us grow in our faith. He writes, my own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through the eyes of others. Literary experience heals the wound without undermining the privilege of individuality. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself like the night sky in a Greek poem. I see with a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Now, I want you to focus on the language he uses. What Lewis is saying is, look, I'm an individual and I remain an individual. And it, it, it's really important to be an individual, but being an individual limits you because it's limited to what you can see. And what Lewis is saying here is that you can keep your individuality, but nevertheless begin to benefit from others by allowing them to tell you what they have seen so that you can find this for yourself. I'm sure many of you have been to Bible studies where you went in, you know, thinking certain things and thinking, I've seen everything here. And in the conversation, as you reflect on the biblical text, people begin to open up ideas which, which you hadn't thought of. And you begin to say, actually, I've seen something I missed. It really has helped me move on. And what Lewis is saying is that reading other Christian writers can really give added depth 
and richness to our own experience of faith. And so Lewis, you will not be surprised to know, commends regularly reading spiritual classics, reading older books and allowing the the clean sea breeze of the centuries to blow through our minds, blow away the cobwebs and give us these new riches. So Lewis in many ways is inviting us to read classics and benefit from them. And I think it's a very important way in trying to develop our faith, to allow other people to, to open up ways of thinking about faith, which might actually bring added depth and resilience to those we take for granted. So Lewis is very, very clear that we can learn from other Christians who can help us to appreciate the richness and the depth of our faith. In other words, they can share with us tried and tested ways of understanding and living out the life of faith, ones that we might not be aware of, but Lewis is saying once we discover them, they can very often give added depth and stability to our faith. And so Lewis will mention writers like Augustine, Dante, Dante is in the background there, and George Herbert. But I'm simply saying to you, Lewis here is saying something helpful, that actually it really does help to read people who talk about their faith, who might help us to see something that we've missed, that might actually enable us to go deeper into our faith. And I'm sure many of you have your own favorite writers who do exactly this for you. And for me, of course, Lewis is one of these writers, but Lewis points to many others who can do the same kind of thing. But I want now to move on and look at something that I think is very significant for Lewis, and that is this whole area of connecting with feelings. What we need to understand, I think, is that for Lewis, apologetics, or indeed the Christian faith in general, works at a number of levels. Uh, At a rational level, it shows us the truth of Christianity. And we see this thing very clearly in mere Christianity, which is very, very strong on these arguments, showing that belief in God makes perfect sense. But also, of course, experience. It's all about connecting with something deeper. It's also about imagination, being able to see the world and ourselves in a new way. And it's also about life. It's about showing how Christianity makes a meaningful life possible. And certainly in the ancient world, when people were trying to assess philosophical beliefs, they would ask about their rationality. But a very key question would be, how does this way of thinking enable me to live a good life? In other words, almost like a criterion for judging a worldview is, does this allow me to become a better person and live well in this world? And certainly we see Lewis bringing that point out very clearly, particularly in his novels, though it's there at points in mere Christianity. What I want to say to you is that in many ways, Lewis is giving you a grid, reason, experience, imagination, and life. I think asking us in in very gracious ways, I'm sure, are you limiting yourself to just one of these or perhaps two of these? In other words, Lewis is really challenging us as to whether we limit ourselves needlessly and unhelpfully to a rather restricted vision of what the Christian faith is all about. And what I want you to notice is that Lewis does not, in effect, say that affirming reason involves denying experience. He's saying these are all integral elements of the Christian faith, and we need to experience them. Now, in my own case, um, I became a Christian really through apprehending the rational capacity of the Christian faith. And so to begin with, I was really quite a, a rational believer And then reading, talking to people, thinking about this more, led me to realize that there was more that needed to be said. I had only grasped part of a bigger picture. And so Lewis really helped me to, if I like, go deeper into my faith, not losing anything, but rather beginning to realize how rich and exciting this vision of faith actually was. 
And so although I began with a very clear conviction, Christianity really does make sense, it's true, I began to realize the way it impacts on experience, the way it affects our imaginations, and also the difference that it makes to life. And in many ways, Lewis is simply giving us this this template and asking whether we have really experienced everything that's there in the faith. That very often we have to grow in our faith, not simply by understanding it better, but actually being aware of multiple aspects or elements of this, which very often we haven't experienced fully. Now, I think it is important and helpful. But Lewis, I think, is really saying something very significant about feelings. And Lewis really is saying that Christianity gives us a framework that affirms the importance of feelings and shows us what we really desire. In other words, it's giving us, a, if you like, a, a framework that allows us to say, yes, we have these experiences. Here is what these experiences mean. And here is how we, how we actually come to possess what it is that they are pointing to. Uh, and one of Lewis's key themes, really, is that nothing other than the living God really satisfies us. And, of course, that's why Aslan is a figure of the heart's desire is so important. And here I think uh, Lewis is channeling Augustine of Hippo, who back uh, in the early 5th century wrote these words as a prayer. To God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And that, I think, is, is very important because there are many people who have deep sense of longing longing for something that is really significant. They're not quite sure where it's going to take them, but they're aware they are lacking something which is bringing them distress, dissatisfaction. And Lewis here, like Pascal before him, is saying what Christianity does is it interprets what your feelings are all about and allows you to realize where they are taking you, that in effect you've allowed surrogates for God to take God's place. And that, I think, is something really important here. I want to move on and end the lecture now by going back to Holy Trinity Church in Headington, Oxford. There it is. I think many of you will have been there. And um, I imagine that many of you, like me, have paused and lingered over this gravestone, which is there. It's visited regularly by many people. And I'd like you to look at the final line on the gravestone. Men must endure their going hence. And certainly, I, I, when I was, had an office in Oxford, people would very often pause, you know, come by my office and say, look, um, we've just been to Lewis's grave. It, it doesn't really say very much about the Christian hope. It has this rather, rather dispiriting line, men must endure their going hence. And it's very interesting because, as some of you will know, this is a quote from Shakespeare's King Lear. And the Lewis family back in Belfast in the early 1900s had a Shakespearean calendar. For every day of the year, there was a Shakespearean text. This was the text for the day on which Lewis's mother died from cancer, which caused the end of his of stability in his life. It was a traumatic moment. And in effect, both Warney, who put the text on the gravestone, and Lewis himself really saw that as being a defining moment in their lives. That's interesting. But Lewis, of course, had a very strong sense of the Christian hope. And Lewis also had this remarkable ability to use very simple language to express the Christian hope. As a thought in tribute to Lewis, it might be good just to end by letting you see his statement of the Christian hope in a letter to Mary Willis Shelburne, dated a few months before his death. I'm going to read this out loud to you. Notice how virtually every word in this statement has two syllables or less. Lewis says, We are like a seed waiting in the good earth, 
waiting to come up a flower in the gardener's good time, up into the real world, the real waking. I suppose our whole present life, looked at back on from there, will seem only a drowsy half-waking. We are here in the land of dreams, but cockcrow is coming. And that just helps us to understand why Lewis is such a significant writer. He's able to use words powerfully, simply, to really give us access to very, very deep spiritual truths. So in this lecture, what I've been suggesting to you is that Lewis actually is a wonderful traveling companion for the Christian life. I'm not saying there aren't any others who could do this, but Lewis is really very, very helpful. He encourages us to go back into the Christian past and learn from writers before him who helped him and could help us as well. He also invites us not simply to think about faith as you know, intellectual acceptance of ideas, but rather entering into a big picture, becoming part of a story, allowing ourselves to be transformed by the Christian faith. And again, I think that's helpful. Lewis reassures us again and again, Christianity can be trusted. It makes sense. It tells the truth. It gives us a new way of experiencing and seeing the world and brings us hope and reassures us that we matter. And you know, we need to be reassured of that all the time. We matter to God, and Lewis, I think, helps to bring that out very, very clearly. But listen, there's much more that needs to be said about Lewis. What I've done is, if you like, to sketch a landscape, and that's why we're going to have a time of Q&A, when I'm very happy just to let you direct the conversation in any way you like, and I'll try to open up new ideas to, in effect, explore how Lewis answers some of these questions and hope that they'll be helpful. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you. If you've got your questions, pass them to the center aisle and we'll commence. Uh, Pass your questions. And while they're doing that, I remember an early writing influence on me said one of the reasons Shakespeare was so profound as a writer is very few people registered writing with as many um, one and two syllable words, uh, uh, which uh, Lewis obviously does as well. But Shakespeare was to be or not to be. That is the question. What is the main reason for the disagreement between Lewis and Tolkien about his desire to write the common Christian and defend the faith? Just say it again. Main reason for the disagreement between Lewis and Tolkien about the decision to write I think um, Lewis and Tolkien um, were both apologists in their own ways. I think that um, Tolkien saw the Lord of the Rings as a work of natural theology, by which he meant uh, it's, it's about how ordinary things in this world have a deeper meaning, have a capacity to signify, to point beyond themselves to something deeper. And Tolkien thought that Lewis perhaps... Um, how shall I put this, made things clearer than they were, perhaps overstated, perhaps was less subtle than might be appropriate. And so I think that if you look at the Lord of the Rings, there are no churches, there's, no, there's nothing there we would call religion, and yet there are these deep religious questions being explored and answered. If I can put it like this, Tolkien, in effect, is writing for perhaps a slightly different group of people than Lewis. And I think that Tolkien felt he was being more subtle and more accessible to that group of people than Lewis was. But both men recognized the importance of stories as a way of engaging the imagination. And both, I think, also, in effect, think it's almost like an obligation on us to tell stories, to illuminate faith, because, in effect, if God tells stories then we need to, in effect, follow in, in those footsteps to, 
to talk about who God is and why God matters. Excellent. Did Lewis have children? Well, the answer is Lewis had no biological children. But I think, if I can put it like this, there are an awful lot of people in the world today whose spiritual DNA matches Lewis's. And it's because they have, they've absorbed his writings and said, you know, this man really is part of my family tree. He has kind of way shaped the way I think. So like John Calvin, and Calvin, his wife never produced children, and his opponents said, that shows that God doesn't like you very much. And Calvin's response was, look, um, and all these people around the world are reading my books, and that is, in effect, an indication that I have children in a deeper sense of the world. I think that's true of those two. Um, after becoming a Christian, what do you believe was Lewis's greatest personal struggle? What do I believe that Lewis's greatest personal struggle is? There, there are several of them, and I find it quite difficult to, to kind of construct a hierarchy, but let me mention some of them. One was Mrs. Moore, um, because Mrs. Moore, Lewis had a complex relationship with her. Uh, he presented uh, her to his friends as his landlady, and later as his elderly mother. And the truth was slightly more complex than that. Um, but um, the issue was that, that Lewis really um, felt a deep sense of commitment to her, but at the same time wasn't really quite sure how this fitted into a, a Christian way of thinking. Um, but, so he, he wasn't really able to resolve that. And in fact, when Mrs. Moore died of, of, uh, at a flu, in a flu outbreak in England after the Second World War, I think Lewis felt that really he could, he could begin again in, in certain ways. And, and he was now prepared to think about having a relationship with a woman, for example, Joy Gresham. And, and it was quite an important thing, but Lewis wasn't quite sure what to do about this. The other thing which is really quite troublesome for Lewis is that Lewis developed his reputation as an excellent apologist, which I want to say is fully merited. And yet Lewis himself was troubled because... Mrs. Moore and his best friend Arthur Greaves were not Christian believers, and Lewis seemed unable to change that situation. And so in, some, in a late letter, Lewis just reflects on this, and, and you know, he's saying, uh, I'm not that good really, am I? And I, I think, it, I think it, it is really quite powerful. It, it is the testimony of an apologist who has been very successful and yet is aware of his limitations. That's another thing I would single out. I suppose the, the, the other final thing which you do see Lewis um, reflecting on is just a sense of um, a deep personal inadequacy. You know, um, what is there that I can do for God? And I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I can go back to an earlier thing, point I made in this lecture, which is when someone said to him, will you write the problem of pain? I think it's almost as if Lewis said, that is something I could do. And that really, I think, made him feel this is something I might be able to do, which would be my service to God, if I can put it like that. But there are many things Lewis is worried about. What sights do you suggest a Lewis pilgrim in Oxford see? His home, the kilns, what? Well, I think um, Lewis... Um, visited most places in Oxford, so um, you are really giving yourself quite a big canvas here to explore. I mean, what I would suggest you do is to um, visit University College, which was his first college, and then go and have a look at Morden College, where, of course, he, he um, was there for 30 years and wrote some very significant pieces there. You might go and visit the Kilns. They'd love to have you there and, and show you around. You might also go and visit um, Holy Trinity Heading and Quarry, which is where he's buried. And I think that's all good. But I think my own feeling is that in many ways, the best thing to do is just walk around Oxford and just think, look, there, there many people have walked these streets before me, including C.S. Lewis. And there's a certain sense in which I've come to a city which has these very powerful memories and has been a stimulus to so many people. And Lewis is clearly a very important part of that. But actually... As one of the people in the audience here tonight will know, um, very often you find yourself surprised by Oxford, and it does some very strange things to you, very good things. How would Lewis's writings and stories be different in this day and age with access to Google, the Internet, and social media? 
Well, I think the, the, the short answer is they would be very different. But of course, if you were to say to me in what ways, I'm not really very sure. I think it's a good question to ask because, you know, there are those who would say Lewis's narratives are limited in terms of being embedded in a very specific culture. Think of, for example, England um, during the Second World War, a very different world which has vanished now altogether. And, and some people reading, for example, Chronicles of Narnia do find the depiction of um, the children, which are very much embedded in British middle class values of the time, a little bit difficult to cope with. But the answer is not to rewrite these. It's just to step into this world and let Lewis bring you into a different world. So my feeling is that we value Lewis for what he has done and resist the temptation to, um, to make him someone else. All right. This is a, an interesting um, question, and it's, it's someone who's been troubled by something they read in Lewis and hoping you might be able to bring some uh, uh, perspective to it uh, that might help. Uh, in the screw tape letters, Lewis points out how easy it is to trick our minds into believing that we do good for God when often we are doing good only for ourselves. This has troubled me since I read it. Um, has anyone ever truly done good? Can we overcome selfishness? Our selfishness goes undetected sometimes even by ourselves. One of the themes that runs throughout um, some of Lewis's writings is the human capacity for self-deception. Um, Lewis reflects on this particularly when thinking about the First World War. He, he finds it very difficult to, to write about the First World War because his memories were so traumatic. But Lewis criticizes those who say, in effect, look, we've learned something from the First World War. We're never going to do that again. And Lewis says, no, we will because we don't learn from the past. We have this immense capacity to delude ourselves. And so, you know, when Lewis is coming up, when the Second World War breaks out, you know, Lewis is one of those who's saying, look, um, we didn't think this would happen, but it has. We've got to realize what this says about us. And Lewis, of course, is not simply saying that we're self-deluded about our capacity to, to inhabit a peaceful world. He's also saying that we delude ourselves a bit about our spiritual lives as well. And so what is being said there in Screwtape Letters really is somebody, in effect, um, almost trying to, um, to, to erase this, the idea that we might be doing certain things um, nominally for very good theological reasons, but actually we're, self, we're satisfying something for ourselves as well. So I think that what I would say to uh, the person who wrote that question, which is a very good question, is in effect that Lewis is just saying that we really do need to check ourselves out and ask whether we really are doing things for quite such simple motives all the time. It's not a, a condemnation. It's just a gentle, a gentle critique saying, look, uh, is it really quite that straightforward? Maybe we are doing certain things to please God, but also to, to help ourselves and our social reputations. I mean, let's, let's just be aware of this and try to avoid um, self-delusion. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I, I would... Uh, take the liberty to add, I think it was Luther uh, who expressed it sort of like this, that the best human deed is tainted with at least a little bit of selfishness. And, and certainly Paul quoting the Psalms in Romans where he references no one does a good deed, not even one. Uh, you know, the, it is the endemic problem of humans not to be perfect in any way, shape, form, or fashion, which is why the, the story of the perfection of Christ being delivered on our behalf is so wonderful. Um, is there a resource to use to read systematically through Lewis? And I was actually going to ask you this tomorrow. So tomorrow in class at church, I'm going to do a Q&A with Alistair, God willing. And, and one of the things I was going to ask you tomorrow is, if you've got someone who's relatively new to Lewis, where would you recommend they start? And, and what would you want them to read to make sure that they make it through? In, in what kind of order would you send them? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. It's a very difficult question because, of course, you need to know who the person is, what their capacity for reading is, and also what questions they're bringing they'd really like to have answered. And so it can be quite a difficult judgment to make. I, I would very often suggest they read Walter Hooper's rather good little survey of what Lewis wrote and, and ask them, does something there stand out for you? 
If, if not, and what, I would, what I would say to them is, look, I think that there are two works that really stand out. And these are, of course, Mere Christianity and Surprised by Joy, um, which I, I think are, are two of Lewis's best works. And what, I, what I would do is try to explain to the people I'm talking to what they do and what sort of ideas they develop and what their conclusions are, and ask them, do these sound like a good starting point? But it is very, very difficult. Um, you have to begin somewhere with Lewis, and I think for many people, mere Christianity is a very good starting point. But for others, of course, it might be, as for so many people, the screw tape letters, it might be the problem of pain. I think it's, it's very, very difficult to, to be able to judge quite what the right books to reference are. But I, I would normally say, look, I suggest you think in terms of surprise by joy and mere Christianity, explaining what they're all about and asking them if that seems helpful. All right. What role did G.K. Chesterton play in C.S. Lewis's life, his conversion, his writings, uh, his life? Well, in many ways, G.K. Chesterton is um, a precursor of Lewis and and one who Lewis regarded very, very highly. And, you know, uh, at several points, Lewis refers back to Chesterton and really praises him very, very heavily. Uh, particularly for having, a, if you like, a Christian philosophy of history, that, that, that Cheston shows that from a Christian point of view, history actually makes sense. So certainly Lewis um, really had a very high regard for Cheston. He did not follow Cheston in writing detective novels, Father Brown, but he did follow Cheston in using fiction to uh, set out what Christianity is all about. My problem, I suppose, really is that if you... If you read Lewis and then read Chesterton, you sometimes feel a sense of deflation, you know, because, because Lewis does it better, in my view. And I, th- I think, um, so I, I think what, what you almost have to say is, if, if you want to read Chesterton, read him first, and then, then go and read Lewis. Do you, do you watch the Father Brown series on uh, BBC? Uh, it, it's rather well done, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, oh, here's a softball. Do any recordings exist of the Lewis talks during the Blitz? Yes, they do. Um, the question is how you get hold of them. They were available um, on the web for a while, but I, I've been told by people recently these have proved rather difficult to access, and I'm assuming that's for copyright reasons. Also, there, there are um, uh, parts of chapters that Lewis read out over American radio, and those might be around. I think what we'd all love to have is, in effect, a, a collection uh, of Lewis's um, spoken word, because he has quite a remarkable voice. I mean, it, it sounds a little bit strange now, because we, we kind of we have moved on, but nevertheless, he, he is a very articulate speaker. Kind of like the Eagles' greatest hits, Lewis. Just, yeah. um, can you list a few Christian classics you would recommend reading? Augustine, Dante... Um, well, how, how long have we got? You know, because they, well, happily, there, there are a lot of them. Let me mention some that I think Lewis would approve of. Um, when Lewis wrote Surprised... Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, <coughs> sorry, just let me brush myself. Ah. When Lewis wrote Surprised by Joy, he kind of way said, this, this isn't like Augustine's Confessions, but when I... I have to say that I've, I've always thought it is rather like Augustine's Confession. So I think that's a very good starting point as, a, as, a, as a, an introspective book, which is in effect about entering into someone's minds as they discover God. I think it's very well done. You might think of Pascal's Ponce, which I think echoes some themes that Lewis later develops. And George Herbert, Lewis singles him out as being... A gateway to faith for him because he, he ha- had a view of human nature which is able to do justice to the complexity of human nature which Lewis as an atheist recognized lay in his Christian understanding of human nature. So some of Herbert's poems from the temple, I think, like Love 3, would be a very good starting point there. All right. We have hit a stopping point. I've got a lot of good questions. I will go through these again and see which ones I can ask tomorrow morning. But tomorrow morning, I've divided the interview with Alistair up into a couple of areas. We'll be talking about his own story. It's a fascinating story. It's a story that started in science and has uh, uh, come to this point in Houston. And I think you'll enjoy hearing Alistair's story.
we will talk a little more C.S. Lewis, but Alistair has just finished one of the, the world's best works on apologetics uh, uh, that is, is out now. He has written on history of theology and, 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 and Christian uh, doctrine, and, and there are so many other areas that I look forward to exploring with him. So if you don't have a church home or if you want to just junk it for tomorrow and come to ours, <laughs> then uh, Champion Forest Baptist Church on Stubner Airline, the class will happen in the gyms at 930. In those same gyms at 8, there's a traditional service with traditional old hymns. You can stick around afterwards. There's a modern service with modern songs and hymns. Uh, either way, you'll hear Pastor Jarrett Stevens who can preach it. And uh, so I urge you to consider coming. But would you join me? Wait, wait before you do, recognize we got to get him over there. And he's going to have a very limited time because we got to get him back. So would you join me in thanking him and don't besiege him on his way? Thank you. Um, my thanks to you again for coming. Please be very careful. I'm seeing Oxford all around me here. We've got Oxford. Uh, I, look, you just need seriously to meet the people around you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>